This story happened a couple of years ago, when I was a freshman in high school. I remember me and my buddy Jay would go play Nikki Nine Door, otherwise known as Ding Dong Ditch, which was a game where you would go to a random person's door and knock while running away before it got answered. Me and Jay loved to do this kind of thing, especially on Friday nights when the school week was over. We were the modern day little rascals, looking to get a kick out of seeing any adults become annoyed by our childish antics. One day, during gym class, me and Jay sat on the bleachers while collectively discussing what potential houses we could prey on next. That's when Jay suggested our school janitor, Mr. G, as he casually mopped the side of the gym floor in front of us. Dude, let's hit his house tonight. Apparently his house is notorious for being nine-doored all the time. I don't think that's a good idea, dude. Didn't you hear his daughter died? Oh yeah. Poor little thing was getting teased too much for having pet squirrels. Pet squirrels? Yeah, she was the laughing stock of the school because it was rumored that Mr. G collected squirrels and brought them home just so his daughter could have some pets. Really? That's weird. What in the hell are you two idiots looking at? Yeah, that's what I thought. Don't be talking about my daughter, or any of my business, before I dump this dirty mop water on your heads. That's when Mr. G strolled away with his mop bucket, while me and Jay looked at each other and thought to ourselves that his house would be the perfect stakeout for Ding Dong Ditch later that night. A couple hours later, me and Jay would play Mortal Kombat Armageddon on my PlayStation 2, till it was dark enough to go outside and pay Mr. G's house a visit. As we walked down the neighborhood, Jay pointed out Mr. G's house, which was about two houses down from where we were standing. We played rock, paper, scissors to decide who was going to be the Ding Dong Ditcher, and of course, as faith would have it, I lost with scissors while Jay held rock. I casually approached Mr. G's porch without making it obvious to any potential onlooking neighbors that we were doing anything suspicious. As I slowly began to raise my balled up fist to knock the door, it abruptly swang open with Mr. G holding a large baseball bat, saying, I'm gonna kill you and make you eat my crap, you little squirms! That's when me and Jay made a dash for it and began to run for our lives while Mr. G chased us with a baseball bat in one hand and a long piece of rope in the other. Stop running away, you little punks! You all wanted smoke, didn't you? Didn't you? I remember looking back for a split second and could see the crazed look in Mr. G's eyes, almost like he had been anticipating that someone would Nicky Nine door his house again. As Jay and I glanced to our right, we unhesitatingly made a swift turn towards the direction of a large fence with a hole in it, which led to a forest preserve with a warning sign that said, Danger, do not go beyond this point. We both disregarded the sign and quickly ran through the hole in the fence while trying to not slip on any branches or tree bark piled along the trail. It was about 30 seconds into the forest where I found myself hiding behind a large tree, while Jay was hiding behind one across from me. That's when I crouched down as I heard the footsteps of Mr. G stopping mid-trail, almost as if he knew we were within his parameters. I clasped both my hands over my mouth and began to pray in my head that he wouldn't approach either of us. Stupid kids. If I ever see you again, I'm gonna rip both of your heads off and feed them to my squirrels. You hear me? I know you little pieces of crap are the reason why my daughter is dead. I just know it. I know you two picked on her at school. Am I right? I swear to God, if I ever see you come by my house again, I will turn both of you to my kids. I'm lonely. I just need another child. And you pricks took everything away from me. That's when I heard him slowly exit the woods, as his footsteps became more faint along the way. Me and Jay were so shaken up to the point where we remained hidden behind our respective trees for about a good 10 minutes before we thought it was safe enough to head back on the trail. I think the coast is clear. 
Dude, this is the last time I'm ever doing this. Uh, you think? How in the hell do we get home now? That's when me and Jay had to decide what our next move was. The issue was getting home, as we knew the only way out was through the hole in the fence. We obviously didn't want to run into the risk of encountering Mr. G again, so we both mutually agreed to go the opposite direction and find an alternative way home through the forest preserve. As we got deeper into the forest, I can recall stepping on a gooey substance, almost like it was a dead cat of some sort. Jay pulled out his cell phone and flashed his light towards my shoes, only to see a dead squirrel soaking in a puddle of its own blood. What the hell? Looks like a bear ate it. Dude, that looks gnarly! Jay then picked up the mutilated squirrel by its tail and asked me to take a picture of him with his cell phone. You're freaking sick, dude. He then dropped the dead squirrel on the ground and we proceeded to head further into the trail. That's when we saw about a dozen mutilated squirrels scattered along the pathway. What the hell? Dude, we, we have to go back. Jay? I began to glance at Jay as he looked at me with a gaunt and horrific expression on his face. That's when I realized that he wasn't looking at me. He was looking behind me as he pointed past me with his trembling finger. I turned my head to look behind me, only to see a little girl sitting a couple of meters away from us, having a picnic by herself. As I squinted my eyes, I could see her chewing on a dead squirrel, as she then looks at our direction and said, Please bring me home to my daddy. I want him to know that I don't want to have a pet squirrel anymore. That's when me and Jay ran back towards the direction of where we came from, as we couldn't believe what we had just witnessed. As we made it through the hole in the fence, we continuously ran through the neighborhood past Mr. G's house until we both made it home in our respective houses. I couldn't believe what I had just seen, as the thought of a little girl having a picnic in the middle of the forest while eating squirrels still gives me chills just thinking about it. What happened next was something I could not fathom or give any proper explanation towards. Jay ends up sending me a text and then immediately calls me. Hello? Hey dude, look what I just sent you. That's when I opened Jay's unread message, only to see the picture I had taken of him while he was holding the mutilated squirrel. Except, I can see the same girl from the picnic standing from a distance behind Jay. She was holding a dead squirrel as well, while replicating the same pose he was in. <gasps> It's been a while since that incident occurred. I've been seeing a psychiatrist since, as a mental anguish from getting chased down the block with a baseball bat and witnessing what seemed to be the deceased spirit of Mr. G's daughter is something that still terrifies me to this day. This is a story that has traumatized me for the last decade or so. I need to get it off my chest in order to find some closure. It all started when I was in my early years of high school. When me and my friend Josh would skip class occasionally, just to fool around and spend the latter part of the day walking around the neighborhood, just to kill some time before heading home. Josh and I go way back, as we've been neighbors since birth. Our mothers would always set up play dates every so often, just so we could have some more social interaction with one another. We've been pretty close since, and have even enrolled in almost every class together, which made our relationship pretty tight over the years, despite sharing different interests and whatnot. Josh was a sports kind of guy, while I was more of a stay-at-home gamer. As polar opposite as that may sound, there was this one thing we mutually enjoyed which was skipping classes and playing Ding Dong Ditch during the nighttime. For those that don't know what Ding Dong Ditch is, it's basically a childhood prank that consisted of knocking on someone's door and running away, just to get an oblivious reaction when the person finds no one at their door. We always got a kick out of doing such things, as we found such childish antics amusing, 
considering most of our past targets were a bunch of old hags that would either shout at us or even chase us until they inevitably got fatigued about a couple seconds into their run, we usually ding-dong ditched every Friday night, as it was a common thing for rascals around my age to do. I personally got tired of the gaming lifestyle over time, as I wanted to experience the same adrenaline other students felt when playing ding-dong ditch. It was quite a popular thing to do at the era of this story, or at least from where I was from. The thrill of being chased by a complete stranger was something I craved, as it almost simulated a real-life video game, as if I was playing Grand Theft Auto in the flesh. On this particular day, Josh and I had to unfortunately procrastinate, considering the school day was still taking place. We obviously couldn't head home, as it would look blatantly obvious to our parents that we had skipped classes. That's when Josh and I came up with the idea of spending the next hour or so skipping rocks by a nearby river, while dreading the fact that we would potentially have to face the noise from our professors for missing yet another Friday lecture. Dude, I can't wait for tonight. I can't either, dude. I know some pretty nice houses we could hit up later. Where at? Here. Come with me so I can show you. Considering it was Friday, which was the last day of the school week, me and Josh planned to do Ding Dong Ditch later during the night. I remember both of us started to stroll around the neighborhood, close to our school institutional building, when I spotted an older gentleman mowing his front lawn next to us. He honestly looked quite disturbing, from the dark circles around his eyes and the don't mess with me look he had on his face. It was almost as if he had a sixth sense for the trouble we planned to cause, as he began staring directly at both of us, like we were some kind of fecal matter that didn't belong on his street. We both glanced nervously back at him, and then back at each other, as I could tell from the look of Josh's eyes that we were both thinking of the same thing. This was the house we were going to play Ding Dong Ditch with. That's when Josh and I casually walked past the man's house, and back towards the school premises, as we decided to kill the rest of the day by hanging at the school's outdoor bleachers, where the cheerleading team would usually conduct their dance rehearsals. I remember gawking my eyes at the cheerleaders, while trying to see if I could spot my longtime crush Megan, who just so happened to be a part of the team. Hey Andy, I bet you're looking at Megan, aren't you? Yeah, why? You should just go talk to her, yeah? And say what? I don't know. Maybe that you're handsome and that you enjoy playing Ding Dong Ditch on Friday nights? Shut the hell up, dude. As accurate as my friend Josh was, I was always prideful in admitting that he was right. I honestly could never muster up the courage to ask Megan out, as the adrenaline I got from her presence surprisingly seemed more overbearing than Ding Dong Ditching a stranger's house. I remember staring directly at Megan as if my eyes could travel directly into the depths of her soul. It was almost as if I could see her internal extremities surrounding the circumference of my eyeballs. That's when I began to have bizarre visions of her insides being shredded up into a million pieces. Hello? Are you gonna ask her out or not? I said she's dead, all right. What the hell are you talking about? My bad. I meant to say she's taken. Dude, you need to get some sleep, or else you'll be the one that's dead if you get caught during Ding Dong Ditch tonight. About several hours later, I began doing laundry while awaiting Josh's arrival. The time was around 8pm, when Josh finally makes his way to my place to play Ding Dong Ditch. We casually procrastinated in my bedroom by watching a few YouTube videos on my computer until my parents were sound asleep. I wanted to make sure they didn't see us sneaking out of the house, as my parents tend to be strict with their household curfew rules. As we quietly made it out the front door, me and Josh began walking in the direction of the neighborhood of where the man's house was that we saw earlier during the school day. About 10 minutes later, Josh and I stood behind a tree across the street from the house as we can visibly see the curtain lights illuminating from the television in the man's living room. Both of us were extremely timid and nervous, which was quite unusual considering we had both ding-dong ditched about a dozen times in the past. But something felt off about this house. 
Josh and I then looked at each other and began to contemplate who was going to be the ding-dong ditcher and who was going to hang back on the driveway. No matter how much back and forth bickering we did, I knew in the back of my head that I wasn't going to knock on that man's door as my anxiety levels were oddly shooting through the roof. Just knock on his door already, you wimp. I've already knocked on the last three houses we did. It's your turn now. Dude, I can't. I have a feeling he's going to open the door as soon as I step on his driveway. Fine. If you're going to be such a wimp, then at least have the balls to egg his house. Yeah? With what eggs, genius? That's when Josh pulls out an egg from his pocket and hands it over to me. Do, Do it. it. Do, Do it. it. Do, Do it. it. I began to feel lightheaded, like everything was moving in slow motion. I didn't know if I was extremely paranoid or if the man's stare from our initial encounter had sparked an internal fear that I wasn't able to put out. That's when I broke out of my hazy glaze and unhesitantly threw the egg towards the man's living room window. My heart sank in my stomach as the singular part of his window surprisingly shattered from the egg. Josh then whispers, it was a hard-boiled egg and abruptly sprints in the direction of where we came from. I felt completely shell-shocked, as I couldn't move any muscle in the fiber of my being. It was almost as if I had lost my ability to run or walk for that matter. I remember crouching down and remaining hidden behind the trees, as I can hear the man come out from his front door and say, I smell vermin. I then heard nothing but silence, as the tension in the air was insane. My heart began beating at a rapid pace, to the point of where I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I didn't move from my spot, and even went as far as to cover my mouth with my hand, just in case he could hear my breathing from afar. What makes this story all the more disturbing was what transpired next. I remember seeing my crush Megan walking down the sidewalk towards the direction of the man. It seemed like she was going for a late night stroll while listening to music through her headphones. I obviously couldn't say anything, as I didn't want to blow my cover, nor did she even know who I was, so I remained hidden behind the tree. That's when I hear the sound of a sharp blade puncturing Megan, as she began to gasp for help. I honestly felt like lunging myself towards the man, but I didn't want to run the risk of jeopardizing my own life. As I slowly peeked to the side of the tree, I can see Megan laying on the man's front lawn, completely covered in blood. I could also see the man in the back revving his lawnmower about several times, while trying to get it to start, as if he was strangely going to mow his lawn in the middle of the night. What he did next? was something I could only describe as inhumane. He began to lift the lawnmower in mid-air and disturbingly places it on top of Megan's abdomen. I could then see the blood spewing everywhere as the blades from the mower had begun dicing Megan up. Like she was meat getting minced by a meat grinder. The amount of blood and human matter being ejected out of the discharge chute of the mower was something I could only describe as callous and barbaric. I was 17 years old at the time that the story occurred. It was me and three of my closest friends from high school, strolling around the neighborhood at around 10 p.m., trying to prey on what house we could potentially play Ding Dong Ditch with. Ding Dong Ditch was basically a game where someone knocks on a stranger's door and hides when the door gets answered. Me and my friends were little rascals by heart, and would always get a kick out of doing such mischievous activities like this considering we were young and dumb at the time and couldn't find anything else better to do than find ourselves doing juvenile pranks. For more context, my friends' names were Ryan, Jesse, and Darren. Ryan was the skinny one out of the group, who was faster than all of us considering he was a tall and lengthy kind of guy. Jesse was the chubby one, who was surprisingly fast for someone his size. And then there was Darren, who was usually the ringleader when it came to doing such disobedient ventures. 
It was about a 15 minute walk around the neighborhood when Darren spotted an old vintage style looking house on the corner of the street. Hey guys, let's hit up that house. Okay, who wants to go first? Not me. You go first, Ryan. You're faster than anyone here. Uh, I think Darren should go since he chose the house. Y'all are a bunch of wimps. Get out of my way. Darren then casually walked over to the house and made his way up swiftly onto the front porch as me, Jesse, and Ryan hung back to observe the ding-dong ditch. I remember vaguely seeing a silhouette of a head looking at Darren from behind the curtains of the window. It was hard to tell since it was extremely dark, but I decided to give Darren a warning just in case someone was really there. I instinctively yelled, Darren, run! That's when Darren abruptly slams his fist on the door several times, despite my warning. I then remember splitting the scene with Jesse and Ryan, while Darren followed behind us. I remember running down the street a little bit faster than usual, as I was genuinely scared that the person behind the curtain would come chasing after us. We were all hyperventilating from a mixture of adrenaline and exhaustion, when Darren shouts at me, saying, What was that yelling about? I'm pretty sure I saw someone looking at you from the window. Did you guys see anything? Nope. Uh-uh. That's when we all began to eventually part ways back to our respective homes. Ryan and Jesse walked towards a local bus stop as they lived about two minutes away from each other. Me and Darren went our own separate ways as he lived opposite from where I was walking. I began to walk home as the walk was about 15 minutes give or take, so getting there wasn't so much of a hassle. I remember pulling out my headphones to listen to some music from my cell phone when I saw a car casually driving on the street next to me. It was a little unsettling considering how dark it was outside and how the car didn't have its headlights on. I remember glancing at the vehicle through my peripherals just to see who this person was, but unfortunately couldn't see anything as their windows were rolled up and tinted. I decided to abruptly stop and casually play off as I was looking at my phone for some directions on Google Maps or something. That's when I noticed the car had oddly stopped as well. I now knew that this car was definitely following me. I wanted to 100% make sure I wasn't being followed, so I decided to walk and then stop once more, just to see if the car was going to mimic my actions. Once again, the car stopped in sync with my actions, at the same exact time I had stopped walking. I then put my phone in my pocket and began to unhesitatingly sprint like a wild maniac, running through bushes and hopping over fences, just to get away from that vehicle. I eventually made it home and decided to peek through my living room window, just to see if the car was still following me. It didn't. Just the street lights and houses on the other side of the street. I then crawled into my bed and disregarded what had just occurred. I honestly could have notified my parents or even my group of friends about the bizarre encounter, but ultimately decided to keep it to myself, as I didn't want anyone thinking I was some sort of scaredy cat. The following Monday, I went up to meet with my friends at the school lockers, as we usually did just before class officially started. We noticed that Darren wasn't present, nor did he respond to any of our group chat messages, which was quite uncharacteristic of him. I honestly assumed he was sick and couldn't answer the phone. We all then proceeded to our math class and began sulking in boredom from the algebra lecture my professor was conducting. That's when Ryan, Jesse, and I ironically got called down to the principal's office through our PA system. As we made our way there, I remember seeing Darren's dad standing next to our principal, except he looked extremely distraught and agitated. Do you boys know where my son is? No, sir. No idea. Last time I saw him was on Saturday. He hasn't come home since he went out with you three. So I want to know, where is he? Where the hell is my son, you little pricks? It's been nearly two decades since Darren's disappearance. Me and my friends have disclosed everything to the police since, regarding the homes we've ding-dong ditched, to the potential foes Darren could have possibly had conflict with. I even went as far to let them know about the vehicle that followed me that night. The information left a lot of gray areas within the case, as I didn't get a license plate number, nor did I see the individual driving the vehicle. All I can hope for is that Darren is somewhere out there, and that he's not dead or held against his own will. I sometimes daydream during the day, and have optimistic visions that Darren will one day make his way home. Or at least, that's what I hope will come to fruition.